Uh, good evening. I think we are finally ready to begin, and we appreciate your patience as we get all the uh, technology set up here in this great uh, new high-tech auditorium. Uh, I'm Richard Lodge. I'm the managing editor of the Daily News, which is co-sponsoring this event tonight with the uh, Greater Newburyport Chamber of Commerce and also our media partner, which is Newburyport, Newburyport Community Media Hub, home of Port Media. We uh, will also be sponsoring another candidates event on October 25th at the Knock Auditorium from 7 to 8.30. That will involve the two candidates for mayor incumbent Donna Holliday and challenger Robert Cronin. And I hope you can join us then. It will also be on cable. And again, that's, that one is 7 to 8.30, different time than this one, and it's October 25th. And I would also note that uh, the election is November 7th, which I suspect all of you already know that. And now I would like to turn this over to our moderator tonight, Attorney Grace Conley. Thank you. So good evening and welcome to uh, the City Council debate. Um, I want to thank the Daily News, the Greater Newburyport Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and the Greater Newburyport Community Media Hub, NCA Hub, home of Port Media, um, our sponsors for tonight's city council debate. Our panelists this evening are David Strand, who's chairman of the board of directors for the Chamber of Commerce, Margaret Denner, a student at Newburyport High School and member of Newburyport Youth Services, and Richard Lodge, managing editor of the Daily News. Um, I want to thank all of you for your participation and you for attending. As the moderator, it is my role to ensure that the debate proceeds smoothly in accordance with the agreed upon rules. So I'm going to take a moment to explain how the debate will run. Tonight's debate will be conducted in two parts. The first debate will focus on the Ward 4, ra ward four race, and there are two candidates for the one uh, council seat. And the debate will be between incumbent Ward 4 Councilor Charles Tontar and challenger Ali Santalarsi. Uh, the second debate will proceed immediately afterwards and will focus on the at-large council race. There are seven candidates vying for the five at-large council seats. The rules for both the Ward 4 and at-large council debates are the same. Each candidate will have two minutes to make an opening statement, which will be done in the order of appearance on the ballot. There will be no closing statements. The panelists will take turns asking questions to the candidates. The questions and topics have not been provided in advance to the candidates. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer a question and no rebuttals are permitted. The official timekeeper this evening, Chris Johnston, will verbally announce 30 seconds to indicate when a candidate has 30 seconds remaining and time when the candidate's allotted time has expired. The debate will be broadcast live on Port Media Cable TV. Members of the audience are permitted to take photographs without flash and to record and live stream the event provided that it is done without causing any disruption or distraction. No political signs or posters are permitted on the stage or behind the candidates. There will be no questions or comments from the audience and the audience is asked to please hold all applause until after the debate has finished. If you haven't already done so, please also turn off or silence your cell phones. And now let's, let's meet our candidates. It is my pleasure to introduce the Ward 4 candidates, Charles Tantar and Ali Santalarsi. Ali Santalarsi is listed first on the official ballot and therefore will begin with her opening statement to be followed by Charles Tantar. Good evening. I'd first like to thank the Daily News and the Chamber for putting this debate together tonight, and i also like to thank Charlie for showing up tonight. My name is Ali Santalarsi, and I live on Forrester Street. My goal is to, above all, service Ward 4 as Ward 4 City Councilor. One of the great things about City Council and the way it's set up is that each ward has a councillor who can focus on the issues that are near and dear.
in the neighborhoods and get hyper-local. If elected, I have three top priorities. Family safety. The Merrimack Street traffic situation is a priority. Safe street crossing, walking, cycling safety, all need attention. Areas on Merrimack Street, such as Pioneer Field, Cashman Park, and all of the, the crosswalks in general are a real priority. Sidewalks, roadways, and tree hazards are not another issue for Ward 4. Sidewalks and roadways and proactive tree management would be very helpful. Improved streets and sidewalks will enhance Ward 4 safety and make our neighborhoods more beautiful. By proactively maintaining our trees, we can prevent damage to cars and homes. Affordability and infill the raising of taxes are a real concern in Ward 4, and it's a concern to me also. We need to keep this city affordable for all of our public servants. That means our police, fire, school teachers, and city workers. And I'd like to thank you for listening tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Tonta. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, the Daily News and the Greater Newburyport Chamber of Commerce and Industry for sponsoring this event, and especially for uh, allowing the Ward 4 candidates to be here. It's the third time I've run. It's the first time uh, I've been welcome uh, to attend the debate. Um, born and raised upriver in Lower Massachusetts, I moved with my family to Newburyport in 1999. My son attended the NOC and uh, graduated from Newburyport high school in 2005. When he was at high school, I was elected to serve on the school council. Since 1977, I've been a professor of economics at Merrimack College, and my area of specialty is urban and regional economics. When I first ran uh, for council four years ago, I promised to be accessible and available and to hold office hours. Uh, I have done it. I have met that pledge every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. I'm at the Riverside Cafe. Anyone can walk in, which is behind the toll building. Anyone can walk in, talk to me. <clears throat> I, I really believe that face-to-face -face and eye-to-eye -eye contact is extremely uh, important, and I'll do it if re-elected. Uh, in terms of ward uh, issues, I've worked very closely with Sergeant Cohan, especially in the morning pick-up and drop-off bus period when students are going to school. Um, and and uh, I think we've gotten, made a lot of progress on that. Secondly, I have responded uh, to the need to address potholes and sidewalks and streets. And a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, my, compo uh, my opponent uh, requested that a sidewalk be repaired, and I think we got to it fairly closely. Thirdly, I put a special uh, emphasis on Atkinson Common. Uh, service at large on the council, I have been chairman of budget and finance uh, for four years. I am painfully aware of the need to balance, on the one hand, our desire for lower taxes, and our need to provide the best possible public goods, education, and public safety as we can. Twice I have moved that we reduce taxes, and twice I've moved uh, that we reduce uh, sewer and water bills. Once successful. Thank you. Thank you. And now, for the first question of the debate, I turn to panelist Richard Lodge. Uh, Ms. Santalacci, um, you mentioned the traffic and uh, speeding along Merrimack Street. It certainly is a growing problem in that ward. Uh, police sometimes set up radar. They've erected a portable lighted speed sign there. So what more can the city council specifically a ward counselor do to, to improve things and to address this problem? Thank you. As a new candidate for Ward 4, um, I have been a member of the Merrimack Street Safety Group for over two years. Uh, Christine Wallace formed the group about two years ago, right after um, I almost experienced an accident myself on Merrimack Street while walking my dog, and since then I have stopped walking Merrimack Street. So it's near and dear to my heart. I also have recently joined Walking and Wheeling, and will be also working with another group. Um, and what we're trying to do is get some state funding to have some plans drawn up, as well as working with the city, and we're looking at identifying priorities 
putting together a list of areas we can look at first in addressing those, as well as developing a longer-term plan which will offer things like calming and more recognition of speed. It's a dual-pronged approach, and we have to start somewhere, and we're also going to enlist the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission in developing a plan for this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think that I believe Councilor Tarr, you got to yeah. jump to the answer. I haven't answered this yet. Yeah, uh, I believe the question was what further can be done. Um, and I think it's a good one. Uh, yeah, there are traffic problems uh, on, on not only on Merrimack Street but also on High Street uh, and on Mosley uh, and on every single one of the cross streets. Uh, Plummer, Jefferson, Ashland, Forrester, Woodland. I won't name them all. Uh, I get, you know, their complaints that people are going too fast. One of the things uh, on the Public Safety Committee that I advocated very strongly for, as soon as the legislature made it uh, possible, was to lower the city speed limit to 25 miles an hour. Uh, there was some resistance on the, on the part of city officials, but the council passed that unanimously. So you've seen perhaps the signs that have limited speed limit to 25 miles an hour. I believe that that is the first step in changing the culture uh, in the city. Uh, and it's not you know, the culture. That we've had a problem, the crosswalks, not necessarily the first car, people will stop. It's the second car uh, that goes around, passes on the right, especially on High Street. Uh, and and that, that's a cultural question that very much needs to be changed. What, at the same time, the 25 miles per hour um, speed limit was given to us that we could do. Uh, the, the state also established uh, a safety zone legislation, and we, for instance, at the Pioneer League, can establish a safety zone there with a 20 mile per hour limit. I'm also looking into doing the same thing at the entrance to Atkinson Common on, on uh, Plummer Street. Thank you, candidates. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, this first question is for Charlie. Thank you. I, I do know the format. I'm just being reminded. Thank you. Um, may, I, may I call you by your first names, folks? I, I, I know Charlie well. And Allie, I'm going to have trouble uh, pronouncing your last name. Would you mind if I called you Charlie and Allie? Is that okay? Sure. I'm Thank fine. You. Thank you very much. Um, Charlie, um, uh, we have a unique situation in this, in, this, uh, in this race in that the only other two people running against one another are yourselves other than the mayoral candidates. So I would like to give you both an opportunity to tell us why you think you are qualified to be a candidate, not only for your ward, but also for this city in which you'll be making some decisions that will go beyond your ward as well. Thank you. Um, sure. You know, I, uh, I often get asked why I decided to run, both four years ago and currently. Most recently, um, I, uh, the eighth grade students from the NOC did a, did a mock city council meeting, and one of the actually the way they put the question was, why in the world would you be a city councilor? You don't get paid very much money, and, it's all, and we see that you do a lot of work. Um, and I think that's true. The answer that I said, I, I answered it by asking another question. I, I, I said to them, have you performed community service? And, and almost universally they had, either through the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts or, or through uh, church or school oriented. And I said, that's, that's why I'm doing it. I'm running because uh, this is my form uh, of community service. This is, uh, I feel I have a skill set uh, as an economist uh, that uh, I can bring and have brought for the past four years to the council. And it, uh, it gives me a particular perspective that would not otherwise be there. And uh, I, I think it's uh, helpful for, for um, to, to bring that skill to the council. So essentially, the bottom line, uh, I do it um, because I want to serve my neighbors, my community, and try to, uh, so Newburyport's a wonderful place, and I'm just trying to make it a little better. Thank you. Thank you. I have, in many cases, followed city government very closely. It's always been of interest to me, but since I'm retired, I now have the time to commit and to volunteer and to help the people in Ward 4. I feel it's time for payback. I feel I have the time. I'm no, no longer traveling on business constantly. And so rather than 
grouse about what's going on, I decided that I would throw my hat in the ring and I would try and serve the people in Ward 4 in ways that would be more as a shepherd, that would be a person who would give them an ear and listen to their issues as well as be their voice at City Hall. I believe, as their counselor, if they vote for me, I work for them. And if I work for you, I need to represent you, listen to your concerns, bring those concerns to a level where they're recognized and we have pos pos positive and probably good outcomes. We can't let things fester and not address them over long periods of time. So that's why I have decided that I would run for city council. I would like to help the people in Ward 4. Thank you. This is for Ms. Sintelassi. <laughs> How will you communicate with your constituents, whether that's telling them what you plan to do or what, listening to what they want you to do? Thank you very much. I will communicate with them in the way they need me to communicate. There are many different methods of communication that are comfortable for different people. There are people who don't go to Facebook. There are people who don't use email. There are people who would feel better if they could just call me or ask me to come and sit with them and listen. They may be handicapped. They may have other issues where they can't get out or they can't find me in other ways. I want to be completely transparent, visible, and reachable. And as part of my campaign, when I leave a brochure on someone's step, I also include my phone number. So if they don't want to talk to me on Facebook and they're not comfortable with email, they can pick up the phone and call me. And I'd be very happy to listen to what their issues are. If I don't know what the issues are of my constituents, it's my fault. And it's my job to know what they're concerned with because their concerns are my concerns. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, I do believe in the importance of face-to-face -face contact. And uh, so that's why I've had office hours at the Riverside Cafe. Uh, people you know, have come and talked to me and, uh, and that, that is, that's extremely useful. I also, uh, you know, uh, my cell number is is available. Uh, my uh, you know I also leave it on a leaflet and and is my um, my email address. Uh, you know just this week, for instance, uh, I went and met with a couple who were concerned uh, with um, short-term rentals. I'm sponsoring um, a, a, a zoning change uh, that would address the short uh, short-term rental. Um, problem in the city, uh, and they wanted to talk about it because they've just begun doing short-term rentals. Uh, and uh, so that, that's, I, I think, seeing them, I spent about an hour at their house, uh, hearing uh, um, their point of view is extremely important. Uh, I, um, you know, again, uh, a lot of people call me. I recall uh, a couple of years ago during the snowstorm, someone called me, and I, I was driving, as a matter of fact, to work, and someone said, you know, you're the worst city councilor ever. And I said, uh, I know that, but what in particular have I done? And he said, well, the snow is just all over on the street. And uh, I said, oh, sorry, I, I know that. Uh, fortunately, DPS happened to be removing snow right in the corner next door, and, uh, and I was able to get them to go out and clear the street. The next day, I got a call, and uh, the person said, Councilor Tonta, you uh, are the best city councilor ever. <laughs> so that was a, uh, you know, thank you, Tony. I really appreciate that. Uh, and thank so, you, Councilor Conter. Uh, time. Pardon me? Time. It's time. Your I time is up. <laughs> I thought I saw 30. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, Charlie, a question for you, and it's not about snow. Um, <laughs> thank you. The, the company that owns uh, the Merson building wants to redevelop the property. Yes. Within the past year, they came forward with a plan <laughs> That would have included quite a bit of a uh, number of condos in the parking lot there, and that w was withdrawn when there was a lot of opposition to it. What do you want to see happen to the Merson property, and what role can a city councilor play in that? Well, uh, before the, um, the public meeting, I met with the Kane brothers, 
they showed me the plans that uh, they had done for uh, the Merson building, and, and they, you know, they had this concept, and the concept essentially is that they would uh, create a place where people could live, work across the street. In order to do that, they would have to uh, build a 450-space parking garage. I told them then uh, that was not going to happen, uh, I, you know, and, and I think they appreciated that. Uh, when they had the public meeting, they, they knew that that was not going to happen, and so they, they, that will not happen. Their concept, and this is what I found interesting, because uh, you know, I served on the subcommittee that wrote the chapter on economic development and the master plan, uh, and one of the things that we saw is that we thought there's a great opportunity in Newburyport to attract corporate offices and other professional uh, things. And, and they, they hired a consultant and came to the same conclusion. So what they want to do there is create corporate offices uh, and other social services. Uh, we th I think that's a great use. I, th I would like to see them improve the, uh, the parking lot across the street. I think it's in their interest to do that. Um, they already have a... Uh, uh, a Newburyport company that is outgrowing its space, is interesting in relocating there. Uh, one of the best things that we talked about is, and if they, if they can pull this off in terms of the revenue they have, is they want to open up the center, they want to have a coffee house in there that will be open to the public, and, and have a way to get to the river there so people who live in the neighborhood would be able to walk through. The council has already changed zoning to allow uh, corporate offices there, and uh, I think that's a good thing. Thank you. Uh, same question to you, Ali. Uh, what do you want to see happen at the Merson property? I think when we talk about the Merson property, we're talking about the existing building as well as the parking lot across the street because it's one package. Um, so I think in the building, the idea of corporate office space is a very good use of that building because it's clean, environmentally safe, and the building is there. And if the Merson Company is agreeable to opening up part of the waterfront as part of that, then it's a win for the neighborhood and the surrounding neighbors. As far as what happens across the street, that's now going to be affected by the new zoning. And they can't really build there without getting a permit and permission for what they want to build over there. And I think that's a really good thing because, again, it will involve the neighbors, the surrounding homes, and so on, with some input as to what will be appropriate and not be um, inappropriate for the neighbors. That, to me, is the most important part of the deal that's being put together right now, is that there will be input on what happens in the existing parking lot. Thank you. Uh, this question now is, uh, you can start with Ali. Um, the question is about park maintenance. Um, I'd like you to speak about your thoughts on how we would maintain Atkinson Park in particular, of course, which is in your ward, excuse me. Um, but I welcome your, uh, to give, this is gonna be your last question, so I welcome the opportunity to talk about park maintenance in general, uh, as well as Waterfront Park, if you'd like to speak about it. As far as park maintenance goes, I believe that we need to address this across the entire city, not just Ward 4, not just Atkinson Park. Um, I think every park should have a budget for maintenance. Now, the Atkinson Park hit here um, historically has been maintained basically by donations um, and a group of people who have done a lot of work. We have had one maintenance person, and I think we're, we're hiring a new maintenance person now that will pick up um, and be more helpful in what's going on at Atkinson. But to further that, Every park deserves to be maintained. I don't believe that the city should be building open space and parks without planning budget dollars to maintain all of the parks. It's too expensive to go in and replicate things that fall apart because they haven't been maintained. And it's not really a proper way for city to use the parks with parks that are not well maintained, with drinking fountains that are not working, etc. Budgeting is the point. Um, yes, I uh, actually was a member of the Belleville Improvement Society that, that did manage uh, Atkinson until relatively uh, recently. Unfortunately, uh, the kit uh, taker there uh, embezzled money from the, from the society a couple of years ago. 
He's gone to court and has pledged to return the money. But there's a major change that took place two years in the city. The city now has a separate, distinct parks department. Uh, that parks department uh, has, has a budget. Uh, it has a director. And so uh, Atkinson Common now is being cared for by the parks department um, as, as along with the other park. One of the reasons that occurred is because uh, Atkinson, and to some extent, uh, the Bartlett Mall was, was, and, and Mosley Woods, because they had commissions, was getting more attention than the other parks. And so now it's spread out a little, um, a little more evenly. Uh, I advocated for uh, a separate parks department, and we were able to get that separate parks department. Uh, secondly, the city now does have a parks conservancy that uh, I have supported. Uh, and we put on a concert, a 4th of July concert, a Roots, American Roots music concert, as a fundraiser uh, for the parks. So we, and, and, and it had been extremely successful. Uh, and so we have a, a way of getting additional funds for the parks, and we have a parks department that is handled. We have some work to do. We still have a little bit of a challenge, um, and, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Okay, now we're going to take about a three-minute break and uh, switch some things around on the stage. Thank you very much to the Ward 4. Yeah, thank you. So good evening, and now we're going to have the second debate, which is going to focus on the at-large council race. There are seven candidates vying for five at-large council seats. The debate will be between incumbents Barry Connell, Joseph Devlin, Greg Earls, and Bruce Vogel, and new candidates Jenny Donahue, Robert Germanera, and Afroz Khan. And it's my pleasure to introduce the counselor at large candidates. And because of the order of appearance on the official ballot, Councillor Bruce Vogel, you may go first with respect to your opening statement. Thank you all very much. Oh, boy. Um, as um, introduced, I'm Bruce Vogel. I'm the opening act. And, uh, <laughs> it would normally be called a ditty, but I think I've told you many times I do not sing. Um, I'm new to town. I moved here in 1992. And, um, uh, as a city councilor, I take a uh, progressive approach to the position. Um, I also uh, do a tremendous amount of homework so as to not be a rubber stamp, and I pride myself and take great pleasure in being able to admit my mistakes. Um, I'm also a straight shooter, which um, makes me a very horrible politician. It um, doesn't go beyond me to call out misinformation or to um, point out that someone is uh, taking a self-serving position. And um, some call me, I guess, a, uh, a uh, curmudgeon, but uh, others have another, other names for me. And so it goes. I have a few passions. What my, my, my number one passion is to work towards uh, consensus um, through dialogue. And it's easier said than done, and though I continue to try, uh, it is a passion that is often not um, fulfilled. I'm also passionate about doing away with the harm that uh, misinformation and innuendo and um, just rumor has um, on our community and our process. And I'm also very passionate about this community. Uh, eight years ago when my wife died, I had the opportunity, no kidding, I had the opportunity <laughs> to um, uh, move. My kids were gone and so on and so forth, but I didn't, I stayed here. And I got elected for, as city council, um, I downsized. I bought a local business, uh, fell in love, and um, I've served four years as city councilor and four years as the Ward, four count, Ward 5 councilor. If I continue to run, I'm standing here asking you to vote for me so I can continue to run. I'll continue to seek consensus. I'll continue to put out proper information, and I'll do everything I can to make this community comfortable, attractive, and welcoming. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vogel. <laughs> councillor Joseph Devlin. Bruce, no comment. Um, my name is Joe Devlin. I am a counselor at large, finishing off my uh, first term. I live here in town with my beautiful wife, Nicole, and my young children, Liam, Jack, and Kate. I also have a law office here in town. I ran last time based on the slogan, say yes to the five S, which is schools, streets, sidewalks, safety, and services. 
these are the core services that the city provides that I think are at the heart of you know, the quality of life for residents, and we sometimes don't uh, do them well and we lose focus on them. I also ran because I am a lawyer and I wanted to bring my legal skills and my experience in 160 municipalities across the Commonwealth to properly vet projects, to help improve them, and to, to hopefully uh, uh, bring more consensus to projects. I'm really proud of the progress I made on my goals in this first term. I've uh, sponsored seven or eight uh, resolutions and ordinances focused on uh, increasing money for sidewalks uh, and other capital improvements or improving the way we do those capital improvements. Um, I led the way in uh, the first uh, budget on budget cuts that, uh, to the general fund that increased funding for the schools. Um, and I was really happy to see a lot of those cuts stayed in the next budget, which meant they were correct. Uh, but I'm most proud of, after a number of debates, people on the losing side came up to me and said, you know, you didn't agree with us, but we want to thank you because you made us feel like we were heard again. And that's what I'm all about. So I'm asking for you to vote for me on November 7th. I am number two on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Devlin. Mr. Robert Germanera, you're next. Good evening. Uh, Rob Germanara, uh, 50 years old. I'm a resident of uh, Two Ashland Street and a native son. Uh, my two boys are here tonight, Brock, age 23, and Jack, age 21. Uh, I'm a professional tractor trailer driver for the last 32 years and uh, a proud graduate of uh, Newburyport High School, maybe the only one on the stage, in 1984. Uh, I'm a proud member of a COW, a Committee for the Open Waterfront, for the last five years. And uh, more important than all that, I am a taxpayer just like most of you in the audience tonight. Uh, I'm very proud of uh, having personally uh, and directly responsible for uh, bringing Lower Custom House Way, that's the down river side of the Custom House, back to the people of Newburyport, along with the help of uh, Ward 2 Councilor Jared Argerman and uh, Attorney Bill Harris, a 43-year uh, advocate and attorney for... Uh, the uh, Committee for an Open Waterfront and uh, the Central Open Waterfront. Uh, of all the people up here, I'm uh, the only one responsible for championing a sidewalk ordinance through the City Council, from the back of the City Council, uh, as a taxpayer and a concerned citizen, having not missed a City Council meeting for five years. And that ordinance uh, calls on the contractors when they receive a variance or a special permit to be held accountable to fix the sidewalks in front of those houses. Um, I am also the person that pushed back on the Kane Merson property and uh, forced that uh, development to, to stop and uh, actually took it a step further through the City Council, forced them to go to a special permit through the City Council uh, and not by right. So I plan on taking that same spirit of cooperation and I ask for your vote on November 7th to the City Council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Germanera. Uh, Councillor Barry Connell, you're next. Thank you, Grace. Uh, first, I want to thank the Daily News and uh, the Chamber of Commerce and Port Media for pulling us together tonight. Uh, this is the first time we've had a chance to all sit together, although we see one another knocking on doors and traipsing up and down the streets of the city, uh, meeting voters and finding out what they have in mind. <clears throat> but first, a little bit of biography, because my wife reminds me that not everybody in this city uh, has lived here for a long time. Uh, most of us are carpetbaggers and I count myself among them. We arrived here in 1978, uh, bought our first house on uh, Milk Street, and if you saw me during those years, I was the guy with paint-spattered clothes and a glob of plaster in his, in his hair because uh, it was a renovation of an old um, historic structure, 1770s colonial. Um, we moved up to Woodland Street, have two children, both of whom graduated from Newburyport High School, and uh, as a uh, proud parent there, I wanted to make sure that they went to good schools, and so uh, at the bequest of the, uh, of the mayor at the time, uh, I ran the uh, debt exclusion campaign that renovated this building, a couple years before that having run the debt exclusion campaign that renovated our library. So spending all that time on city affairs, I figured I'd run for city council, and I've been on the city council now for 14 years. The items that I care most about, the ones that drive me, are those that are related to my uh, professional life, actually, education. Uh, environmental protection, 
um, as an environmental professional, as a, as a professional educator who just retired this year. Um, there are several things that I think we have to emphasize. One, uh, control of development, particularly limiting infill, which seems to put greater and greater pressure on our resources. Environmental protection, making sure that we get the, the water that we need and the sewer services that we need, as well as pick up uh, trash in a timely and efficient fashion. And the thing that I'm most proud of in my service on the city council is the collaborative way I work with mayors. And I think if you talk to any mayor over the time that I've served on the council or before that, they would affirm the fact that that is what distinguishes my service from many of my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Council Connell. Jenny Donahue. Thank you. Um, is this on at all? Okay, hi, sorry. <laughs> I hope that doesn't count towards my time. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you. I am Jenny Donahue. I did actually grow up here in Newburyport and attended our city's public schools. Um, I did get married and have a son named Oliver, and Patrick is here in the audience. Thank you. I chaired, um, I'm sorry, I joined the Newburyport Commission on Disabilities in 2011 and I have served as chair for the past five years. I worked very hard to build that up from a very dwindled commission, and we have fostered a very good working relationship with our city's ADA coordinator. A strong work ethic and exceptional, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> a strong work ethic and exceptional communication and diplomacy skills have been well honed by my experience uh, in six years of public service and over 20 years in the service industry, including nearly 10 years as manager of a small chocolate shop, which of course was a very sweet experience. Um, so I have been very lucky and um, very thrilled to have the natural ability to problem solve and think critically. I also have a very dedicated commi commitment to the things that I care about, such as good public schools, safe and accessible streets and sidewalks, and I have a propensity to always stand up and bring a stronger voice to the people that are a little more marginalized and vulnerable in our city, including people with disabilities, veterans, seniors, women, children, working class families, the LGBT community, and people with diverse backgrounds. <clears throat> um, I have learned a lot from my work as a, a civic leader. I have learned exactly how the city council operates and what its function is. I feel that I have a good grasp on what the job entails and that I am qualified and well-suited for that position. It is with um, great respect and I very much would like to serve my community in this way, but I can't get there without you, so I would ask each and every one of you to vote number five on the ballot for Jenny Donahue and help me help our city be the very best it can be for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Donahue. <coughs> Councilor Gregory Earls. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for the organizers for putting this together. Thank you for coming out. And I specifically want to thank my wife. Uh, we've been together for 40 years now. And without her um, honesty, without her, her support, I couldn't do the work I'm doing for the past 14 years. Um, I just wanted to publicly thank you and perhaps embarrass you a bit. <laughs> I, I was asked recently um, by someone who had just moved to the city, why do you want to do this? We were at a gathering. Um, and she said, why do you want to do this? And, and I gave the answers. Um, uh, I, I like giving back, I like to serve. She said, no, really, really, why are you doing what you're doing? And I said, you know what, I've worked in business all my career, um, for-profit business. I've even owned, I've been self-employed. For the last seven years, I've been working for a social service organization, working with at-risk youth. And, and what the social service organizations do is they take in as little money as possible, as opposed to businesses who bring in as much money as possible. And the businesses then give out as little as possible, and that's called profit. But social service takes that tiny bit of money and spreads it out as, as well they can to help everyone. That's why I have to disagree that we don't run our government like a business, we run it like a social service organization. It's not about profit, it's about people. What we do is that we are, we, we educate our youth. We make sure that, that seniors can stay in their homes. Um, we have safe streets. Uh, our, we're responsible for clean water. Um, that's what we do. And that's why I'm running for city council. Um, I, Byron Rushing is a, uh, state rep from South Boston, and I, I hear, I get to see him every day, I bring uh, my youth that I teach uh, to hear him speak every year, sorry, not every day, every year, and he has a wonderful thing that I'll paraphrase. He says, City Hall is not the government building, it's the people's building, it's your hall, it's where you can come, be heard, be seen, and be respected, and that's why I'm running for City Council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Earls. 
Afroz Khan. Okay, thank you. Uh, I first would like to thank the Chamber, the Daily News, and Port Media for bringing together this forum here. My name is Afroz Khan, and I'm asking for one of your five votes for City Councilor at Large. I came here to Newburyport in 2005 with my husband, Amr Ibrahim, when he joined Pentucket Medical. Shortly thereafter, our two daughters, Arissa and Anya, were born at Anna Jakes, and they've been attending the Newburyport Public Schools. So as your city councilor, I would use my knowledge in understanding budgets, my sense of fiscal responsibility, those that I've gleaned during my tenure of serving as treasurer on a few boards, including the Newburyport PTO. I'm also an experienced collaborator. So as an engineer, I've worked with multiple stakeholders in developing national efficiency specifications. So with these skills, what I want to do for the people of Newburyport is actually to delve into the issues, to actually try to figure out how we could communicate areas where the city is working on projects and make sure people are hearing them about them effectively. A simple example is I believe people should know when sidewalks and streets are being updated. So I will also bring more conservation programs, such as what we've seen in the South End with the compost pilot, as well as what we've seen with the LED conversion of street lighting, not only are these environmentally friendly, but these also save the city money. And then finally, I want Newburyport to be a city that's enjoyed by everyone. And what I mean by that is whether you've been here for generations, for decades, or just a short time, you know, people should be able to stay here, thrive here, and retire here. So while we can't change the cost of living, I do think we could support certain programs. And I'm, gonna, and I'm a strong supporter of inclusionary housing, but also seeing how we could leverage local efforts in other jurisdictions, as well as look at state programs. So again, my name's Afroz Khan, and I'm asking for you to consider me for one of your five votes for city councilor at large. Thank you. Thank you. And now to begin the questioning from the panels, I again turn to Richard Lodge of, oh. Okay, so Margaret Denar, you're first with the question. This is for Mr. Vogel first. What is one thing we need to do better in our schools, and how would you go about that? <coughs> That's an easy one. Um, <laughs> so as I think back to my arriving here and my kids going through the school system, there's always been this concern about how much of the budget is going to the schools, and it's usually over the 50% um, of the municipal mm -hmm. budget is usually over 50% is going to the school system. And then there always seems to be this battle every year, year in and year out, as to how much is left and what is going to be cut or what's going to be put back in. And we have arts and we have language and so on and so forth. So I think one of the things that we need to do better is we need to increase our income into the community. And I think that one of the ways that we increase the income is through economic development, working with the chamber hand in hand and working towards economic development so that we can bring in more uh, tax money, essentially and maybe work towards a split tax rate where the um, business, um, in businesses and business park um, plays a higher tax rate than, than the um, homeowners. But I think that money is the answer, and I think that once we get a handle on including um, perhaps some um, school, some type of um, um, college prep classes or um, some um, uh, other schooling up, maybe perhaps in the community, and bring it along, um, that will help a lot. Same question uh, for you, Joe Devlin. Um, I have uh, sat on joint ed for the last uh, two years. Um, I've also attended uh, the uh, workshops that we had on um, the schools. And the number one issue at those workshops and in joint ed is communication between the school system and parents. Um, I would also say that we need to do a better job at uh, having the school committee and encouraging the school committee to send us as a city council an aspirational budget. There's too much emphasis on sending us a budget that we will accept. I want them to send us an aspirational budget that, that maybe goes up three, four million dollars. We don't have three or four million dollars, but make us have the discussion in, in, we have committee meetings on the budget and make us have the discussion so we understand as a council exactly where they want to go and what it's going to cost to get there. And the last thing I would say is listen to the parents. Um, 
One of the things that uh, you know, we have here is school councils, uh, which are made up of parents and stakeholders, but there's no conduit for those to get to the school committee and the, and the, and the city council. And, and those are important things. We need to listen to parent-driven priorities. Mr. Chairman, our same question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lodge. Well, the first thing I think we need to do is keep a superintendent for more than five years. I'd really like to try to think outside the box uh, next time around here and uh, maybe look within or something a little different. Somebody's going to stick around and have a long-range plan. Uh, as a product of the Newburyport uh, school system, I recall uh, taking Spanish uh, in the eighth grade. And, uh, you know, I think Spanish should be the second language of the United States of America. It should start in the seventh grade. And I'd like to see that position funded properly. Uh, you know, just to take it as a, as a class, somebody should be able to get out of high school and speak Spanish fluently. And I, I don't think we have enough emphasis on that, so I'd like to see that addressed. The school budget is uh, roughly $32 million in FY18, having sat through all the budget uh, hearing uh, meetings. 28% of that goes to the special education. And so that's never going to uh, decrease. That's going to be going up from, from here on in. I watched uh, the budget and finance uh, subcommittee meeting, and uh, since uh, May 31st, 2016, Councillor Cronin, the Ward 3 Councillor, uh, had a proposal for 50 cents increase on the parking uh, downtown, and for that 50 cents uh, to be dedicated to the schools. I think we should revisit something of that nature rather than build on the parking garage and really dedicate that 50 cents towards the school. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Connell? <clears throat> yeah, I think that uh, there are several things that uh, are required to have a, 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 an excellent school system, and I think we're getting closer and closer. The rankings keep on coming out, and we're bouncing around. Somewhere in the upper 10 to 15, sometimes 20 percent of schools among the 350 cities and towns in the Commonwealth. Uh, but we've addressed one of the issues that always comes uh, to the forefront when you're talking about quality schools, and that is the school structures, the buildings themselves. We have great schools right now. This building was renovated about 15 years ago. The Knock and the Bresnahan are virtually new right now. So we've addressed that issue. But there are a couple of others I think we have to attend to. One, school leadership and personnel. Let me talk about them both. First, school leadership. Our superintendent's leaving. Uh, I'm on the uh, committee to search for a new superintendent of schools, as I was on the previous committee that selected Susan Vaccaro as our superintendent. I'm sorry to see her leave. Understand that she's at a retirement age and she wants some time to spend with her husband. Number two, um, besides leadership, is staffing. Finding the best staff. Not just putting out feelers and waiting to see who walks in the door, but going to the, to the programs where they're taught and asking who are the best, the most promising people who are in your programs coming out who are going to come into our public schools. And third, expand some of the curriculum offerings right now. Certainly foreign languages on the middle school level have given some kids in the past an opportunity, such as my daughter who became a German scholar, but not many of our kids now have that opportunity unless we start them early. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Donahue, same question. Yeah, can I actually hear the question again? Mm -hmm. What is one thing you can imp uh, we need to improve in our schools and how would you go about that? Okay, thank you. I just got a little muddled with many different answers. Um, that is a great question, and while I, I certainly can see that our schools have improved tremendously over the years, um, from the structures to the general way that they are run and operated, um, one of the things that I would actually like to address is raising more awareness with the students and staff on how to, how to um, interact with people that are different than them, whether it's people with disabilities or people who identify differently. I think that there is still a fair amount of information that is just not understood. And people do end up feeling um, marginalized or not included. And that is something that is, is most of the time just born of sheer unknowing. And it seems that in this day and age that we could certainly do more to address that. We have a lot more options for teaching and, and raising awareness. Um, but I, I just think that we need to have more involvement in the community from our students. We need to be made more aware of specifically what the issues are within the schools from our students and not just what all the grown-ups think is going on. So there's a few different perspectives you're going to hear up here, but that's one that I, I think that 
we could take a little um, a little looking at more. Thank you, uh, Councillor Earls. Um, I've, I've been sitting on Joint Ed for probably about 10 years, and a lot of these things, uh, these challenges, um, which lead to improvements, have been talked about for quite a few years. Um, the new superintendent, there's really opportunity here, um, and it was discussed in the last meeting, that do we look to hire someone new, in other words, a younger superintendent, um, with maybe new, fresh ideas, or do we go with an experienced um, superintendent? There's pros and cons to each, and that's something that, that Barry and the, the committee will have to work on. Um, special education funding is a big challenge. It's always a challenge, it's always the unknown. So when they set their budget, that's the number that they really, the school committee just has to throw a number at and hope for the best. When enrollment happens, then they see what that number may really be. We have to find a way of making that a more stable number through an alternative um, revenue source. It could be on the parking, uh, it could be on something as pay as you throw for garbage, that would be um, specifically put, put special ed, uh, education funding. I think we need to look more into dual enrollment. Uh, Amesbury is doing that. We actually go to community college while you're in high school. And um, the distant learning lab is really underutilized at this point. It was a short money way of bringing in visiting professors into a virtual classroom for, for, for um, items that we can't offer, such as expanded world language, AP courses, uh, and the like. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Khan? Yes, thank you. That's a great question. And I have uh, one daughter in, eight, in sixth grade and another in third grade, and so Epinoc and Bresnahan. And I've been fortunate enough to see the transition of our public schools over the years. Uh, I've seen us consolidate from neighborhood schools into one big elementary school, and I've seen the impact of how the, the school structures are uh, growing in terms of how families are coming together as educational opportunities are happening. So with that said, I um, am very, very, uh, I would say I'm actually very excited to see some of the developments that have happened at the school. And I talk about specifically about the STEM lab that's at the Bresnahan Elementary School, um, the Knock Auditorium updates. And so there's a lot of things that have come from external sources, I guess is my point one of which the PTO funds uh, field trip buses, and then we have the NEF, the Newburyport Education Foundation, that also assists. So we know that there's challenges with, this, with the budget, given the constraints that we have. I do think it's worth challenging ourselves to look outside of what's our typical structure and see how we could gain more revenue. I've heard some great ideas from the panelists here. I do want to also point out that our special education department there are definitely challenges that I have seen that I feel like we do, do need to provide a little bit more support there, a little bit more understanding of what we want to give to the kids uh, in our SPED program as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Devlin, we're going to start with you on this question. Uh, what do you believe to be a realistic final price tag for a garage, and do you think it should be built? And if not, what are the options to get cars off the waterfront, which many people have said they, they want? Well, this is an easy one because I voted for it. So um, I obviously, uh, it, you know, approve of the parking lot as it's constructed. I did a tremendous amount of work uh, on the garage to uh, not only, I think, bring it into a more aesthetically um, um, uh, good-looking and, and appealing uh, structure, but also more befitting that part of town and, and the size and structure of the architecture in our town, uh, but also to make it more economically viable. Um, a, what do I think the final number is going to be? Anybody's guess uh, over the last two years that I've been on the council, I don't remember a budget esti an estimate that has come in on budget, um, so I don't know the answer to that. Um, and, uh, you know, there are lots of options uh, for, the garage, for getting parking off the waterfront. Uh, right now, the option we've chosen to go with, and, and I think it was, and I think it'll turn out on the ballot to be that as well. It was the consensus. Of, it's going to be the majority of, of residents are, are thinking that the garage is uh, the way to get parking off the waterfront. Um, so that's the way we're going right now. We've also, through my work and Councilor Eigerman's work and, and Sharif and, and Charles uh, Tontar, we all got together and we, we uh, fixed the purchase and sale agreement so that the purchase and sale agreement gives us the land free and clear from New England development. And uh, so we could also put a surface parking lot there if, if the cost proved unfeasible. Thank you. Mr. Germanar. Thank you, Mr. Lodge. Uh, I believe that estimate is going to run between 17 and $20 million when we're done. 
And I would rather see us borrow uh, money and bond it out for 20 or 25 years and rebuild the sidewalks and the streets that are existing in the city. Uh, as far as uh, the parking issue, uh, I know it very well. Uh, Michael Sarbaside has 82 parking spaces, the Black Cow has 20, and the uh, new ale house coming online next year has eight. That's 110 spaces for an 1,100 seats of restaurant. And, uh, you know, I don't believe the taxpayers should be funding this at all. And any shortfall, uh, you can call it what you want, is going to be paid for by the taxpayers. If New England Development wants to develop their property, and rest assured, they will develop it, let them build a parking garage on their own property. Uh, right now, the way the ordinance sits, they'd be allowed to use the parking garage because it's in with uh, so many feet within their property, and uh, that's just not right. Uh, Rockport shuttles people in. That worked very well. I see them do that uh, in the past River Fest here that uh, took place a couple of months ago, and that could work. Sure, it's convenient to park right on the waterfront, but uh, that needs to stop. And, uh, you know, uh, th this uh, administration is doing a disservice to the people when they tie in the parking garage and holding that hostage to an open waterfront. Uh, and I think that's just wrong. So uh, $20 million. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Well, I think the, the original appropriation was uh, pretty easy to arrive at and uh, was made with the assistance of uh, federal and state funds, which reduced the amount that we were going to have to pay to, to build that place. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm fairly confident about is that this will come in on time and in budget. It's not tough technology. It's a box with ramps. It's well-established technology. It's, it's been done in other communities throughout the North Shore. But let me point something out to those folks who say, oh, it's going to run over. I can think of seven projects in this city that have come on, on time and on budget. The library, the high school that you're sitting in with a $361,000 surplus, uh, the Knock Middle School renovation, which was very complicated because it was a renovation of an existing building, uh, the Bresnahan School, the Senior Center, the water treatment plant, and the sewer treatment plant, with one exception there in, in that they, uh, the sewer commissioners took the order control uh, measures out, which we reinserted after the fact. So I think we have a history of completing projects on time within their budgets. And this is a much simpler project than any of those that I've just mentioned. So I feel uh, quite confident that uh, we're going to be able to do it on time and pay for it with the existing revenues that come from parking fees. Uh, thank you. Ms. Donahue? Yes. Um, so, of course, this is the big question of the night. Um, I, I would actually guess that it's, it's certainly not going to come in um, with the budget they're, they're expecting. Uh, I, I think that the magnitude of the, it's, it's, I think it is more complicated than people are going to believe. There's a lot of talk about having it be 24 hours, having it be um, fully automated without people actually manning the building. There's several issues that I have with this. The main issue that I have with the parking garage at all is that they are dangerous. They are not conducive to people with disabilities. They are difficult for conversion vans to get in and out of. They are not well spaced for handicapped parking. Um, those are my biggest issues. My second issue is that the location of it is not going to serve people with mobility related issues at all. It's not going to serve the people that park at the waterfront because they want to enjoy the water and they are seniors. They're not going to schlep all the way from Tickham Street to go to lunch downtown if they have a mobility related issue. I don't feel that this garage is going to serve the entire community at all. And because of that, I feel that it's, it's not worth all of this if it's not going to be beneficial to everybody. And there are alternatives for surface lots as far as getting cars off the waterfront. I don't think that we've explored that enough. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Earls? Uh, to answer the first part of the question directly, I believe it's going to come in at $17 million. So you can put that in ink. Um, <laughs> what, what I, I, I voted for the garage to be smaller. Um, when I ran for mayor four years ago, I put out the idea of satellite parking spaces. To be honest, it wasn't embraced. It wasn't that well received. So I'm modifying my thought that if you build a smaller parking garage, you will still have the energy and money left over to get something on the east side of State Street where parking is also needed. It would be a surface lot. No offense, but we're looking at the Daily News building and, and the lot next to it, um, which are possible surface lots, and it's where, where it's needed. Um, they told me when paid parking um, when, when initiated 10 years ago that downtown would, would be lost. No one would ever come. That's simply not true. I don't think this garage is going to hurt downtown. My only 
My only thought is that I was hoping that Waterfront West would be built in a way to connect the existing downtown to the Waterfront West. The current design, and we'll probably get into that later, doesn't make that connectivity at all. We have the option of allowing uh, New England development to use the garage. Right now, the way the overlay is written, he's not allowed to use any off-site off, off parking. So right now, that's the way it sits. If we allow him, or if we change the zoning for that project, it's our fault, it's our bad if we allow any spaces to be used off that site of Waterfront West. So it's just not true that at this point, um, New England Development can use any spaces on the garage. Thank you. Ms. Kahn? Um, yes, uh, I believe there was two parts to your question. Do you mind, you mind um, asking that again? Sure. What do you believe to be a realistic final price tag for the garage, and do you think it should be built? And if not, what are the options to get cars off the waterfront? Great. Thank you. Uh, so when it comes, you know, I am an engineer, and when it comes to uh, projects and estimating costs, you go by what, uh, what one of the other uh, counselors said here is uh, projects done in a similar scale. And so I do applaud the effort that there are efforts to look at other similar types of structures and what kind of costs they come at. So um, approximately coming up with a number for me is going to be really hard. I know where it's slightly slated around 14 million. Could be definitely, you know, plus or three, four, five million more than that, or um, depending on the project and how it goes. So that's kind of a, a rough ballpark. Um, in terms of the question, and I believe you asked, am I in favor of it? Was that the, the second in there? Is I am in support of the garage, and I will say that uh, I did look into the aspects of where it could cover so many things based on the size of the city we are. I do tout that public safety is a huge thing. You know, we have our kids and uh, elderly grandparents when we walk into town, people looking for parking, and it's, it's a little scary when you're trying to rock around town. So I, I, I am in favor of the garage. I think based on long-term planning of the city and how it's developing, it makes sense. Um, in terms of plans for off-street parking, which I think are under development, so, you know, expanding our open waterfront and the central waterfront to a, a more green space, I think is, the, is an excellent direction. So I see good things happening, but it's, it does involve working together. Thank you, and that comes back to you, Councillor Vogel. Well, I get a little time to think about it, thank you. Um, I would think that the, uh, I'll throw my dart at it'll be under $15 million, make note of that. Um, I was a strong advocate for the garage, and I actually believe that we are building too small of a garage. I think the demand for the garage will be much more than, than is anticipated. Um, I believe getting the cars off the central waterfront is the desire of the community. It's been talked about since I moved here just a short time ago in 92. Um, we do have um, waterfront parking that will continue to exist on the east side. Um, which is unfortunate, um, fortunate that it'll be there, but unfortunate that it does not get the cars out of the central downtown. Um, along with the building of the garage, I think we absolutely need to take a look at the um, um, uh, traffic studies and, and get, the, get cars out of downtown. Again, as a strong advocate for the garage, I, I talked with the uh, abutters. I know that the abutters um, have concerns, and I understand that they, 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 we've been talking about this garage for a long time, and they did buy a home right on top of a property where there was going to be a garage. Um, I, I don't believe that the planning board will allow New England Development to make use of that parking garage. If they did, I think they must be deaf. Um, and the reason that the alehouse didn't have to provide any parking is because that was the law at the time. So I think that we'll be fine as far as uh, New England Development goes with that garage. Thank you, everybody. Um, on the way in, I asked someone in the audience what, what they would like to hear. So uh, this is actually a bit of an audience question, but um, don't you know it's about the waterfront? Uh, this first question goes to Mr. Uh, Germanar, um, our native son. Thank you. you know, Rob, I think it's only fair that everybody, and I want you all to think about this for, some, for a second, he's the only one with a nickname. So I'd like you all to refer to this question from a point of view in which you give yourself a nickname that has giving you, that gives you the unique perspective to answer the, the question, which is um, the waterfront has been a debated issue, as we all know. Um, one of the components of the future of the waterfront has been discussed is a welcome center or a visitor center. I'd like you to speak about that specifically, and specifically as it relates to your perspective on Newburyport being a tourist community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strand. Uh, the nickname's easy, uh, the Cape Ann Man, and uh, 
That's what my friends used to call me because they said I never wanted to leave Cape Ann. And I said, well, why would you? We have Newburyport, Rockport, Salem. I'm where I'm supposed to be. I'm in Newburyport and the surrounding area. It's very beautiful and very lucky to live here. Uh, I know quite a lot about the waterfront. Five years ago, I pledged myself to get very involved in it. And uh, I'm a huge advocate for replacing the temporary bathrooms that the Five Cent Bank was so generous to donate many years ago, over 30. I was in high school, I recall, when they first put them up. And uh, I'm for replacing that uh, in a similar footprint and the information uh, booth. We have a couple of gals on that, uh, Mr. Taplin's wife uh, being one of them, uh, who are sitting down there in less than ideal conditions in the summer heat. And uh, something very similar in footprint, combining those two buildings and in the same general area. I'm against any type of building, especially one that would be built with taxpayer money. Uh, no offense to you personally, Mr. Strand, never to house the Chamber of Commerce. I think it's uh, wrong that we would build such a building uh, for an entity such as the Chamber of Commerce. And I am, uh, as a member of the Committee for an Open Waterfront, I am against any building in that parcel of land between the entrance to uh, the old uh, Davis Electric, the new ale house, and the current location of the visitor booth. No offense, no offense taken, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Cannell. So you want a nickname? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have an old nickname from a fraternity in college called, and it was Otis. But I'm not at liberty to share the story with you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess the, the, and the other half of the question was the central waterfront. Yeah, and I, th I think the, the beauty of where we are right now is that uh, we're finally in a position to see the end of a, a controversy that has been been raging for decades. I, I recall, I, I believe it was in, in, within the first two weeks, but certainly within the first month, two daily news headlines accompanied by editorials. One saying, if we don't solve the parking problem, the city's going to shrivel up and die by the end of the decade. Now, that was 1978. The second one was, if we don't resolve the controversy over what to do with the central waterfront, it's over. New Report's <laughs> going to slide back into oblivion. Well, we're finally solving those problems, and they're linked, and I think appropriately so. Uh, cars don't appreciate looking out on the river. People do. And I think it's terrific that we're going to have the opportunity within the next two years to move the cars, most of them, off the central waterfront, expand that park space so that you and I and all of our guests can enjoy that place. Mr. Kinnell, can I ask you to address the question specifically about uh, do you support a visitor center as well. Yeah, the visitor center portion of it. I, you know, I do think we should have a visitor center there. We've come part way down that road by building a uh, Harbor Masters facility that has restrooms and also showers and laundry facilities for boaters that are visiting. But uh, that, that's part of the solution. But a better solution would be to build a visitor center, perhaps on the central waterfront or perhaps across the street on Green Street, uh, so that uh, visitors can find a place to, uh, to use the Great. facility. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Donahue? Yeah, could you repeat the question and fill your microphone's been a little bit? Sure. Uh, on first of all, I'd like you to give yourself a nickname as it relates to your position here uh, as a potential city councilor oh, and or a nickname from your position. past you think is uh, something that's befitting <laughs> of your personality so we can get to know you a little bit. But well, secondly, everybody and, who knows me calls me Boots, so I'll go with that. They call you what? Boots. Boots? Bootsy, Boots, Bootsy Mama. Well, there it is. You can explain that later <laughs> if you like. <laughs> If these boots were walking on the central waterfront, would there right. be a visitor center? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think I get the gist. Um, of course, I would love to see our, our waterfront nice and, and beautified fully and open. Um, as far as a visitor center, I don't want to see large buildings on what is our last slice of view to the, to the riverfront. Um, we don't really have anything left. Everything is owned by someone else. So that tiny gem that is ours needs to remain open. Um, buildings such as that can be put in other centrally located places, as was mentioned, maybe on, on the bottom of Green Street or maybe over, maybe closer to the Harbor Master Shack, but something right there, um, it's just gonna take away the view and we don't have much of that left. Um, if they did 
make something a little bit nicer than what's there, if it's not obscuring anything, then I don't see the problem with that. I think that maybe they need to address a little bit more about the connection with the firehouse and um, maybe work a little bit more with you know what we already have and providing accommodations for visitors as well as residents who are enjoying the waterfront. Um, but putting a, a big building with you know, visitors center type accommodations, I, I don't think that that's necessary at all. Thank you. Mr. Earls? Um, in, in the 70s, being a New York Knicks fan, um, I was given the obvious name of Earl the Pearl. <laughs> and uh, uh, Pearl and is Walter really what, what, I, what I'd call the waterfront, um, at, at least what it can be. Um, it, it's not half its potential right now. And to be direct, I don't support building a building of any size at the at bottom of Green Street across from, from the new Ale House. Um, I do believe in rebuilding what is there. I mean, that trailer can be rebuilt. It doesn't have to be anything like the Harbor Master, which is, which is grand, and I didn't like the Harbor Master when it was being built. I've grown accustomed to it. It's worked. But I don't like the, the, a, a building cutting off the view at the bottom of Green Street and I'm always an advocate for saying, why do we need to build it? Why can't we leave something for our children to build? It, it's not needed. We have space for it. We have space for a visitor center right, right where it is right now. Um, going forward with the park, it's hard to make decisions of where to put buildings until we have some cohesive plan, some holistic plan. And right now, Cow has a great plan that's at the senior center right now, which is a model, very easy to see. It's not drawing sections cut through. And, and that's a really, really good start. Um, and it won't be all at once. This could be a 10, it could be a 20 year, 20 year project, but it's something we can start slow. Uh, we can raise grant money. It's not easy to get, um, especially these days, but times will change. Um, it, it's possible without having to build on it. Ms. Khan? Uh, yes, uh, so I think we are so close. For a nickname, you could say, uh, well, my last name being Khan. Has everyone seen Wrath of Khan? Like <laughs> Whoa. Khan, we could do this. We are so close to getting to a central waterfront with more green space, and I'm very excited about that. I do think where the temporary bathrooms are right now is an excellent uh, opportunity for some type of a modest structure. And I say modest, and that's all kind of, it could be uh, very, I guess it depends what everyone considers a, a modest structure. So. Given the fact that we are getting close to having more land exposed and that we could have um, more green, green over there, I do see it as something that could be a service uh, type of uh, functionality. In terms of the visitor center, again, if it's a modest type of service uh, visitor center, then I think that could be a great place to actually draw people right there. So for me, I, I, I feel like we've come such a long way. I remember going to design Charette when we tried to get close to a solution, so I feel like it's, it's getting very, very close. And, but again, it's, it's working together, it's hearing everyone's thoughts a little bit, but also knowing that we are very close and need to take these uh, next steps and really think through. Mr. Vogel. So I, I am absolutely in favor of um, a uh, visit. Your, your nickname. Oh, I'm Mr. sorry. Vogel well, first. you know, if anybody knows me, um, that probably would be most appropriately to just call me the nudge. <laughs> and if you want to know, that's why I'm Never a city councilor, you know, I got, in any event, I'm absolutely in favor of um, a visitor center or be it an information center or a historic center. Uh, and if I were to draw it up, which I po can't possibly do, because I can't sing and I can't draw, um, there would be stick figures, but I, I envision where the um, temporary restrooms are, the te permanent temporary ones, and the visitor and the little information uh, building. Uh, two low buildings, two very low buildings, and with a pergola uh, in between them that would be in the shape of a, um, or represent the um, ribs of a ship to kind of, and you know, opening it up down to just very modest and, and small. And I think that that would be the ideal place for the Chamber of Commerce, no offense. Um, <laughs> but the, um, whether, and whether it's built with public funds or, or however it's built, I mean, there certainly be a tremendous amount of scrutiny around it. Um, but I, I think that that is just a gap, and I think it would be the perfect place to put uh, a welcoming center um, on the, right, right there on the waterfront. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Devlin. Uh, I would go with, and, and as those of you who know me will agree with this, it's my middle name, Harmony. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. <laughs> 
And they used to call me that as a kid, and maybe that had, maybe it was, maybe it was satirical, maybe it was. Uh, I, I thought it was yeah. going to be kumbaya, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> but it is apt for this one because what I want down at the waterfront is harmony, and you're not going to get harmony if we build t- to edify people. What they're talking about is from the visitor center covering the pop-up park. That's the piece of land that's being eyed for this. We will not have harmony down at the waterfront with the, cow, the cows, the settlers, the waterfront trust if, if that building is built. I would allow this to be added on to the bathrooms down there or the bathrooms to be done and just make it this much bigger because this is today's visitor center. Visitor centers are so, David, you know this, 20 years ago, this has replaced the visitor center and so we can fit it in a very small space and it, we had counselors do a tremendous amount of work on the ad hoc committee to bring the parties together and that was one of the sticking points that they, uh, that they agreed to not to do, to move the parties forward into agreement. And we voted 11 to nothing unanimously on that ad hoc committee. And now suddenly, which was very public and had public meetings, and now suddenly that ad hoc committee is back into the, the, the same discussion, is back into behind closed doors. I want to protect the ways to the rivers. I want to protect the waterfront views from up Green Street and this, this uh, visitor center would get in the way. But I am pro-business, David. You know that's what pushed me over the edge on the garage. Thanks, Joe. I'd like to ask just one quick build question and give you all uh, 10 seconds to see if I can frame this in a yes or no. We got, we got some sense of consensus that we should build this visitor center from some of you right where it is. Mm-hmm. That sense of logic, to be honest, sounds a bit like, well, it's there, let's build it there again. I'd like to know where that logic is coming from for those of you that think that it should stay where it is. If you can imagine that five years ago it got torn down, I'd like to know why you think it should go right back exactly where it is as opposed to be moved somewhere else, perhaps more logically. And I'd like to keep this to about a 20 second response if I can. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll start with you since we started you with you before. Thank you, Mr. Strand. It's very simple. I'm going to stay in line with the Committee for an Open Waterfront and uh, clear, unobstructed views of the, uh, of the Merrimack River uh, from Merrimack Street. And uh, I am in favor of replacing the bathrooms. I don't care how old you are, young or old, there can never be enough bathrooms. And uh, for the gals that are out there in the summertime heat, to be sitting in that information booth. But why there, I, Rob? Why in that spot? Why, why are we going to put it right there? Because I'm going to stay true to my roots, and that is the okay. Central Open Water, the up? Committee for an Open Waterfront, and we are not in favor of a building in the pop up park. I'm sorry, David, but Riverfest will never save the city of Newburyport. Okay, and there's way too many. To put the Chamber of Commerce in a building there and have that be in control of the park is just wrong. Fair enough. Thanks, Rob. Mr. Cannell. Yeah, I'm not wedded to that location. It's one. There could be many others. Uh, It could be across the street uh, next to the so-called Parcel 8 building uh, because that's right by the parking, and I think people often head to the car and think, gee, I better find a restroom before I drive Mm -hmm. home. It, It could be a shared structure with the Chamber of Commerce, some sort of public and private partnership. I'm not opposed to that. I think the Chamber's contributed a great deal to the city in the past and, and will in the future. So I, th- I think we've got to be open to many alternatives. Thank you, Mr. Cannell. And for clarification, I'm not looking to put the Chamber in this building. That's would be yeah, a wonderful I, I option. Got that. Yeah. We are head of tourism and so forth, and we mm-hmm. think there's a, a role that we play in managing a, in said booth. But I'm, I'm, I just want to be clear, that's, this is not the nature of the question. It's a, it's a heated question that I think everybody in our community wants to know. Hey, what are we doing with this waterfront? Yeah. And there's been discussion of this building. There's been much discussion about it staying where it is. And I want to know what the logic is from your point of view of keeping a building that's going to be effectively torn so down on the Mr. ground. So, Mr. Strand, yes. may I interrupt? Well, yes. I think we should get back to our the question, questions and the, the question format. For, <laughs> the question for Ms. Donahue. <laughs> so, Thank you. The, the question is the location. Yeah. Are you in, uh, why are you in favor of uh, staying where it is? But is this a continuation of the last I would like question? To, okay. Unless everyone would like to not bother to And we're going to have 20 no seconds for everybody? 20 seconds. Yes. I'll okay. keep it I'm very sorry, brief. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Donovan. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. If we're going to replace the bathrooms, fantastic. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. There, there could be other locations, just not on the corner where it's proposed at Green Street. So you're right. I'm not married to that uh, location at all. Let's see what else we have proposed but not on the corner, not the, not the sight line. Yeah, and, and I agree with that. I think this mm-hmm. is, it's probably not the 
best time to just jump in and make that decision, it would be good to know. You know, I'm not also like beholden that it has to be there and see where it might make sense, but in favor of something. It's there, you know, as it was suggested, why invent the wheel, but I'm not <laughs> married to that either. I mean, wherever it, we need to have public discussion or we need to have, you know, vetted out. I think it's very similar. It's grandfathered there. People are acceptable there. You know, sometimes in a, in a small city, we can't get everything what we want. You know, to build consensus, you got to accept 70 or 80 percent. You can't get your 100 percent. And, and uh, you know, if you have consensus along here to 70, 80 percent of what you want, I think that's a tremendous achievement. Thanks, everybody. I'm sorry for the build. Yeah, yeah no sure. worries. Since, uh, since we've got a little bit of a late start, I think maybe we can get a couple more questions in and get a couple of rounds, and I will, just for the record, point out the bathrooms are not going in the Daily News parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> How do you plan to make housing in Newburyport more affordable so that young adults like me can come here after college and be able to manage paying for their homes? No, and that's a great question, and it's one that we struggle with and have struggled with. Uh, we've made some headway, but I, I don't think we've made enough. Uh, I wish I could recall the number, but I believe the number was close to 200 individual um, apartment units were lost in the decade 1990 to 2000, and a little more than 300 in the year 2000 to 2010. We don't have numbers past that time, but I think it points out the fact that a lot of affordable property places where people could um, start their lives in Newburyport uh, are less and less available. We took a shot at it with the 40-hour uh, development out by the traffic circle. I voted for it. I think uh, there's a lot of merit there. It's not just for single individuals, but it's also for families. Uh, it's in a location that can uh, take advantage of uh, the transportation that's offered right there with the uh, commuter rail. Uh, but I, I do think that we took another shot at it uh, in terms of inclusionary housing in our last city council meeting, which was a zoning change that was intended to uh, make it possible for more uh, affordable properties to be built and developed in the city. Ms. Donahue? Okay, so I don't have as much knowledge and experience with this, so I'm not going to say things that I don't really know, but um, I would like to learn a lot more, and I've been talking with people that work with the housing authority. And this is something that is very important to me. I have a lot of friends who work here and can't afford to live here. People that grew mm -hmm. up here can't afford to live here. It's definitely a real problem. We are pricing people out left and right. Um, how we solve that problem is still unknown to me. It is something that I would like to work very hard to find a, sol a solution to, because we need to. We can't, we can't just you know make this a town that no one can afford to live in except the most extreme wealthy. It's, it's just not. This is too special of a town to be reserved for the most elite. It's, we have to find another way. So we just can't give up. Well, I actually build uh, affordable housing in Lawrence. And, and why it's fairly simple there is that there are abandoned lots. Um, you don't have that here. There's no real incentive for a builder to build affordable housing. Um, and we don't have a lot of lots anymore where you can put multiple houses on that you can demand that one or two of them be affordable. Um, as Councillor Connell is saying, the, the, the council is making some headway in inclusionary zoning, but it's a drop in the bucket. Um, the, really, the best way to do it is to try to keep taxes as low as possible. It's watch the water rates. Those are things we can control. We can't control the price of property. It's the free market. Uh, we can't control really what a builder is going to do, except when they build six or more units. Where is that going to happen? In a 40R. Um, we don't have those kind of, 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 of um, lots anymore that can hold that type of housing. So it's a really hard question. What the city is responsible for is the tax rate, um, is the spending, um, and, and keeping the water and sewer under control. Hmm. Great. No, that's an excellent question. And it's something that I've been hearing quite a bit you know, from everybody, that they're feeling really like they're being priced out of the city or can't afford to be here. Um, so again, there are strides that have been made, and I applaud those efforts in terms of the inclusionary housing zones that were also just approved recently. I'm also the smart growth zone with the 40-yard development right by the commuter rail was a very strategic location. It was well thought through. But that is, like others have said here, it's just a drop in the bucket, and there is so much more we can do. I do still want to go back to the opportunity that we could still promote and educate about affordable housing. And part of me is, um, I don't think people have taken time to understand 
how critical it actually is to our community and to actually make sure that we are holding accountable the construction that is being done for six plus units. Not that there's a lot, but actually trying to have a goal in the percent of type of units we want to get um, incorporated into our city. Uh, there are definitely also models in other, in other cities. We're not actually alone. I mean, Massachusetts in general has seen an increase uh, significantly in property. And I feel like it's nice to look at other model cities similar and see what they're doing as well. The Merrimack Valley actually planning authority is going around doing workshops and trying to educate and trying to actually share information across the region on this. And I think it's worth actually involving the community more on those discussions and what the data that they're learning from other cities. Mr. Vogel. Thank you. Um, I think the 40-hour development at the train station is certainly a first step and a huge step, um, actually geared to those that are starting out. That happens to be, a, 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 will be rentals, um, but I'd like to see similar um, in terms of purchase uh, housing. Um, the inclusionary housing ordinance we just passed, I think, is huge. Um, the key to the whole thing is economic development. Um, lowering our taxes for residential will certainly help. We really need to work on bringing uh, business and maybe some industry to the, to the business um, area of town. And I think one of the main things, or one of the huge things that we need to take a look at is getting over this bias or this, this concern about exactly what is affordable housing. There's this knee-jerk reaction that affordable housing is low-income housing, and that just is not the case. Affordable housing, actually, there's quite a level of, um, you have to reach economically in order to be able to get into affordable housing. And I think that as a community, we need to be acceptance of affordable housing and not turn a blind eye to it. Well, part of the problem is we have an attractive place to live and that does drive prices up and we do have a scarcity of, of open spaces uh, where you can build something uh, like the Lots and Lawrence. Uh, I was part of the brainstorming session for the two recent ordinances and, and to try to define the parameters. Uh, for they, they were meant to be submitted in tandem. Uh, one down zoned from R3, which allowed multifamilies, which you would think would allow uh, affordable housing, but it didn't. What it did, it allowed uh, a developer to come in and build three or four $750,000 units, which weren't affordable to anybody, and to infill the property so that reduce open space, reduce uh, uh, increased curb cuts, reduced uh, parking, and it wasn't good for the quality of life. Uh, the recent ordinance, we can, we have to chip away at it, and that where, where it was 12% uh, of any housing over six units was going to require, 12% uh, had to be affordable. That's how you chip away at it. The zoning board and planning board have the abilities to make those uh, uh, require affordable housing components, uh, because a lot of what we have, builders have to get is special permits and variances, and so that allows them to do it. Um, so we have to have strong committees doing that. Finally, like things like the Brown School, the, one of the criteria is who's going to give us the most affordable housing um, and also uh, provide for you service. So, so it's creative solutions like that, and we have to cobble a lot of them together and be creative. Thank you, Mr. Germanara. Thank you. Uh, the first thing we need to do is uh, put a regulation in on the Airbnbs in Newburyport. And I can appreciate the fact that some people, a small percentage, make a living on that, but if we're going to encourage this thing without regulation, we're going to have a situation where more affordable housing is lost. Perfect example is at the bottom of Kent Street, 9-11. Kent Street is a six-unit condominium. Three units recently sold, and they've been converted to Airbnbs, and there's no regulating uh, that uh, right now until an ordinance goes into place, perhaps in the next city council. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, three units here used to rent for $1,000 a month, and uh, that's unheard of in Newburyport. If we allow NED to go forward with their development uh, as it stands uh, down at the uh, Waterfront West, that's nothing more than a glorified Airbnb. Those will be rentals, they're not going to be condominiums for sale, and we are very lucky to have the industrial tax base we have. We, a perfect example would be, we could be Amesbury. They don't quite have the uh, industrial base that we have, and uh, that's a huge thing in keeping uh, Newburyport uh, affordable. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that the City Council uh, very recently uh, finished the inclusionary zoning, which uh, allows 12% of the units to be affordable in any multifamily buildings. And that's definitely a step in the right direction. But I still believe the pushback needs to start uh, against NED so that we don't uh, make Newburyport a 200-unit 
Airbnb on uh, waterfront lots. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. I'm, I'm sorry it's getting so close to the end because we have a lot of topics we could cover, but um, I, th I believe Ms. Khan talked about how critical affordable housing is in our community, and I would be one to say that job creation is critical to our community, and keeping our taxes down by bringing more businesses in. We have a lot of open space in the business park. I know there are some issues that kind of tie that up, but what can you as a city councilor do to bring in more economic development to the city of Newburyport and particularly to bring companies with jobs into the business park? Ms. Donahue, I believe we start with you. Oh, is it? I thought I, I, thought mm. I said it last time. No? Okay. Um, well, I, uh, <laughs> I have a pretty good idea for that, actually. One good way to bring in jobs and revenue would be to um, carry out the democratic process that passed over a year ago. Um, we did vote to approve recreational use of marijuana, and we are stalling on what would be a pretty significant windfall if we actually allowed businesses to come <clears throat> excuse me allowed businesses to come and operate in an appropriate manner that will benefit us tremendously um, the industrial park is absolutely in need of more clients um, it would be nice to have a hotel in that area so that we would have an ability to attract businesses who want to actually come and open up a headquarters where they can actually send their clients that are coming to meetings and things like that that entire area needs to be looked at a lot more considerately. Um, there's a lot of good space down there that could be utilized a lot more for bringing in more businesses into the city. I don't think it makes sense for us to shoot ourselves in the foot at any kind of revenue source when we are struggling with getting jobs into the town, we are struggling with to keep up with a school budget that is, you know, never satisfied. So, these are the reasons why I would never turn away the idea to allow a new revenue source in, in terms of a new industry. This is a new industry, and we have to embrace it. Thank you, Councilor Earls. The, we do have to utilize the in, in, uh, business park um, better. We need uh, clean, um, perhaps clean energy companies, but we need more light, clean manufacturing or um, headquarters there. And there was, years ago, a, I believe a finance company, a credit card company, that was looking to build a tower, basically, uh, right near the 95, um, old 95 uh, roadbed. Um, that's the kind of business that we should be looking for, to allow people to build up. Because of wetlands, it's very hard to build out. So we have to have the planning board and, and the ZBA very um, in tune to, to, if someone wants to build up, to let that happen. But immediately, uh, where that parking garage is going, downtown, I made some um, reference to connectivity, where Waterfront West is. We have basically underutilized lots that will surround the garage. We can continue, basically, the downtown to connect to Waterfront West. I don't like the way Waterfront West is designed right now, um, but it doesn't mean that the project is bad by itself. In fact, it's abysmal the way it's designed right now. But I think there's possibilities there, and I had real high hopes for it. It could make that connectivity where from Route 1 to downtown can basically be revitalized just the way the downtown was. So it's an opportunity right there in the very near future. Ms. Kahn? Yes, um, I, I think this is exactly an excellent uh, topic that we're talking about because there is a significant uh, opportunity for increasing our tax revenue by having and encouraging more businesses in the industrial park. However, with that said, I think it's important to think of the strategy of what it would be for people to, to come over there and what would get people who are commuting or ways that they're coming to Newburyport to be able to easily get to the industrial park if they're not driving. So one of the things that would be really nice is the connectivity and the accessibility of the industrial park, especially when it comes to the commuter rail or other types of ways to get there that would kind of facilitate the maneuvering of, of people. Because right now, the, you know, frankly speaking, the way the industrial park is structured, it's, it's very uh, a little isolated. And the, the connectivity would be, I think, a way to, to also start thinking in terms of making an attractive place for businesses to come. Um, and again, I, I agree with um, the, one of the, with, um, the candidate uh, Donahue that it does, uh, having a hotel is something too. A lot of these companies need to have, when they do have their uh, corporate people coming through, or uh, it's nice to have a hotel that they could go to. So, yeah.
Thank you, uh, Councillor Vogel. Restate the question again. Sure. Uh, what can you as a city councilor do in the area of economic development to bring in more companies and more jobs, particularly to the business park? Um, number one, um, rezone. I think that um, we need to open it up to corporate headquarters, um, maybe even um, um, setback, uh, changing the setback so we could put in such things as data centers that don't require any parking. So let them build to the edges and have their three or four parking spaces for you know the, the, that they need. Um, I think tax incentives. We we provided tax incentives for Mark Ritchie um, and uh, for um, uh, Kirk Erish's uh, the um, what is his businesses out there. So I think tax incentives help. Um, I think we need an economic development position in the community. I think it needs to be hand in hand um, with the um, Chamber of Commerce. Um, we had an economic development position here at one point in time. And um, there, it, it kind of fizzled. I don't, I'm not sure why it wasn't fully supported. Um, but we don't have any collateral. You can't go out and you can't sell the city. Um, I think we need to put that program together. Um, we need to repopulate um, the empty or underused buildings, uh, perhaps advocate for um, um, incubator space or um, what, what would be an innovation center, so on and so forth. Um, and I think collaboration with schools and colleges for extension programs. Um, or, um, since we are close to the, the water, obviously, water-based um, industries, those types of things. We just need to go out and get it. We need to focus on it. And I'll tell you what, if I'm re-elected, that's going to be one of my focuses um, this go-around. Thank you. Well, it's a difficult question because uh, we're not the operational arm of the city. Uh, we're, we're reactive on most issues. The mayor is our, our lead salesperson. Um, Actually, the city council did change the zoning. That's why we call it the business park now. It does allow for office buildings there. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that you can do is, is be creative with the zoning and be flexible with the zoning. Um, we have a lot of different things out there now. We do have two breweries, uh, which has some retail element. We've got a rock climbing gym. And yes, we, we do have it zoned for marijuana uh, growth and sales. I, I am on the uh, working group to try to figure out how we're going to do that. We first met Friday and uh, there's some interesting uh, ideas and interesting challenges, but there's a lot of revenue out of that as well. Um, I think the biggest thing we have to do is we have to be, you know, we, we can't pass ordinances we, that are duplicative or burdensome. We have to pass ordinances, including zoning, that makes sense, that's predictable, that people can easily get, get um, their licensing and permits. One of the things I promised at the debate at the Senior Center uh, two years ago was that I rewrite the transient vendor code and uh, I've created more economic opportunity that way and more fees to the city and uh, it, it, uh, also working with the artists down on Inn Street to bring in artist festivals that bring in more businesses and the businesses down there actually like that happening. So those are the types of things we can do, listen to the people and, and, and help them out and do what they want. Thank you, Mr. Germanar. Thank you, Mr. Lodge. First of all, we have a, a great debt of gratitude to uh, the founding members of NAID, the Newburyport Industrial Development. Uh, just a few of them, Bill Plant, Fred Scott, Pete Morris, Bill Griffin, uh, Jack Pramberg, and I'm sure there's one or two that I missed in there. Uh, for their foresight back in 1966, the year I was born, uh, enabled us to have what I touched on earlier, the tax base we have today. I know the industrial park very well, having spent uh, more than half my life out there at 77 Parker Street. Uh, first thing we need to do is improve the drainage out there. I've seen two one in 100 year floods, one in 1996 and the Mother's Day storm of 2006. Are you that Her old? <laughs> I am, thank you. Uh, the uh, corner of uh, Graff Road and Low Street, the Phillips uh, Glass Company, you'll see how clean the ditches are there. I recall years ago that we funded a position at the DPS to clean all the drainage ditches in the industrial park. We never followed through on that. They've uh, become grown in and they need to be cleaned out again. Also the lighting. I, I uh, tried many years ago as a private citizen to get lighting out there uh, and you can see the difference in some of the uh, LED lighting we have in the city. We need to start right at Little River, uh, right at the uh, entrance, the end of Scotland Road, the beginning of actually Parker Street and we need to relight the park to make it more attractive. I think the park is doing well. Uh, you can, I, I still call it an uh, industrial park. Forgive me, I'm a little old-fashioned. Uh, and uh, I do appreciate the fact that uh, councillors such as uh, Jared Argerman have uh, championed uh, raising the heights and uh, making it so it's uh, more uh, attractive for corporate headquarters and offices. The evolution is taking place. 
and I think it's doing quite well. So I go back to the debt of gratitude to the, to the men who had the vision to start NAID, and uh, we're very lucky to have that tax base. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Connell? Sure. Uh, there are a couple of things that we have done, and that is change some of the zoning to allow a more liberal interpretation of what can go out there. Uh, now corporate headquarters are a possibility. Uh, I think we have to do some recruitment, quite frankly, and put ourselves on the map because companies that are looking for headquarters, pretty relatively small companies, um, uh, probably don't realize that we're even on the map. And so we've got to step out there and, and reach out to them. But uh, one of the things we can do is increase the density of the built space to the open space out there. That would make these lots more attractive to different kinds of companies, perhaps larger companies or companies that do a different type of manufacturing than those um, uh, that are out there right now. And I agree with Councillor, I'm sorry, with, with uh, Mr. Germanara. I jumped the gun there a little bit. Thank you. I? Appreciate that. I thought you were going to say that, Councillor Devlin. <laughs> Councillor okay. Devlin, yeah. too. Yeah, that would so we do have to help them in a couple of ways. One, yeah, it, it's wet. We have to make sure that we maintain the drainage swales and, and work with uh, the residents out there, the businesses out there, so that they do their part in maintaining what is theirs to maintain. And the second thing is through inter inter uh, incremental tax financing, uh, which I think was referred to earlier, and that's one thing that we've uh, offered to a couple of businesses to keep them there or to bring them there. Uh, and that gives us an opportunity to reach out and say, we're putting this on the table. You will pay your full tax burden for a period of about 10 years until you get up and running, uh, but then you're going to pay the full freight from that point forward. Those are the kinds of things that I'd support. Thank you. Madam Mock. I think so, we've, uh, we've run out of time. So I want to thank all of our candidates. Thank you very much. And we can give them a round of applause. I also want to thank our panelists, including our member from the high school, for participating in the democratic process. <laughs> and thank you to all of you for being such a great audience. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job, Bruce. Nice job, Councilor. Nice job, Ron. Thanks. Yeah, I got a little.